This PowerPoint, as well as all PowerPoint presentations by Dr. John McLean, are copyrighted and should not be duplicated or used without written permission. The purpose of this PowerPoint is to explain the hermeneutics or Bible study methods principles for the genre of wisdom literature, in particular, the book of Proverbs. Let's begin by establishing a working definition of a proverb. A proverb is a brief, specific statement about a situational truth that teaches a general principle rather than an all-encompassing, unqualified, or unconditional truth. Proverbs are different than the Ten Commandments in the sense that the Ten Commandments are universal and absolute statements that establish law. Proverbs look at situational truth, situational circumstances, and provide general principles for application to each and every different situation. Therefore, you can have proverbs that seem to say the opposite, but they are applied in different situations. Again, a proverb is a brief, specific statement about a situational truth that teaches a general principle rather than an all-encompassing, unqualified, or unconditional truth. Proverbs are wisdom, the truth of God, at work in the practical everyday situations of life. Solomon, who is the primary author of the book of Proverbs, provides us in the first chapter and in the first seven verses, the primary arguments or major subjects and purposes, major outcomes of Proverbs and the reasons why he collected them and wrote them. In Proverbs chapter one, verses one through seven, it says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The book of Proverbs, the major theme, is understanding a fear, a respect, an awe, an honoring of the Lord God. And those who learn to do that will find in their lives that they will be righteous and just. They will seek equity. They will be people of learning and understanding, of wise counsel. They will be people who are teachable and discerning. And so in this opening verse and the opening chapter, Solomon not only tells us the main arguments and purposes, but he introduces us to many of the themes that will be traced throughout the book. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs teach situational truth, not unqualified or unconditional truth. Proverbs teaches the importance, for instance, of a good work ethic. And a good work ethic will result in a person and their family being provided for. But it doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that life will always result in wealth. But the principle is hard work leads to a life that has proper and needed provisions. Proverbs are not absolute promises they guarantee an absolute outcome. Proverbs will speak about the longevity of life if one follows the principles of God's word. Longevity of life if you honor your father and mother. That children will 
ultimately follow the ways of wisdom if they are taught the ways of wisdom. But this does not mean that someone will not be involved in an accident, incur an illness, or have life shortened due to unforeseen circumstances. They are general principles, not absolute promises that guarantee an absolute outcome. The third principle is that Proverbs presents lifestyle patterns that, if followed, provides the best opportunity for success and blessings. Proverbs provides skill for godly living. In the concrete world, a wise person was a master craftsman, a master artisan, someone who could take the raw materials of earth and make something beautiful and artistic from it. So Proverbs presents lifestyle patterns, and we will look at some of those lifestyle patterns later in this presentation. Proverbs are different than narrative literature, than the Gospels, than the Epistles, in that Proverbs may be studied individually and or collectively according to thematic categories. And in fact, Solomon in his writing tells us that that's what he did and what we need to do. So Proverbs has themes that are sprinkled throughout the chapters. And the blessing is that we get to search and study them individually and or collectively and bring them together for various messages about the wisdom of life. We need to remember that Proverbs are not legal guarantees or contracts from God, but they are guidelines for a blessed or godly behavior and life. If we think that Proverbs are legal contracts or legal guarantees from God, then we're going to find ourselves very disappointed. The principles and the wisdom of Proverbs provides us guidelines. And some of those guidelines are through very difficult and hard situations, difficult decisions where no matter what the decision, the outcome is not going to necessarily be pleasant. Proverbs are not legal guarantees from God. Proverbs are not exhaustive in their treatment of all topics or any topic in its entirety. Proverbs speak to situational truth and circumstances. But Proverbs does not mean that we do not also need to seek the wisdom of wise elders, of wise church leaders, of godly people, and other portions of Scripture. Proverbs also presents a number of stereotypical characters that stereotype many life characteristics, lifestyles, and circumstances. One of the blessings is that you need to study all of the chapters of Proverbs at time to get the entire picture of these characters. But in this presentation, we will present some of the major characters in the book of Proverbs. These stereotypical characters are people that we know. We might even identify with some of these characters at one time or another in our lives. The following cartoon characters are ones that I collected some many years ago from the library at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I've used them throughout the years. So I will continue to use these uh, characters to help illustrate some of the lifestyles and people that are talked about in the book of Proverbs. One of the major characters, and certainly one that we want to emulate, is the wise person. Solomon says the wise person loves wisdom and understanding and receives instruction. They are teachable. They want to absorb the wisdom and word of God. 
There is also the simple person. Sometimes we even call some people a simpleton because these are people who lack wisdom and understanding. They require constant instruction. They don't seem to be motivated to learn, and they often seem to lack what we would call common sense. The simple person is often just lazy about learning, and they don't seem to be able to learn from their failures or their successes. The book of Proverbs also speaks about the fool. The fool despises wisdom and understanding and resists instruction. They are often arrogant, spouting off, unteachable, cannot listen to anyone else, never really hears another side of the argument. The fool does not want to be educated. They don't want to hear God's wisdom and they resist any instruction or correction. The scoffer is more active than the fool. The scoffer rejects wisdom and understanding and refuses instruction. The scoffer seeks to mock others, particularly those who are sharing divine truth. They are more than just unteachable. They will attack the truth and seek to diminish and demean people who hold to godly wisdom. The scoffer rejects wisdom and understanding and absolutely refuses to acknowledge any kind of instruction. The sluggard has a lazy mental attitude and acts irresponsibly as a life pattern. The sluggard is not just lazy mentally, but they are lazy physically. They lack a work ethic. They lack a desire to provide for themselves. They will take advantage of others and they contribute very little to society. They are more than willing to just lay back and let others do the work and then beg for others to rescue them from their own lazy life pattern. Proverbs also speaks about the playboy. The playboy is driven by his lust, which leads to his destruction. The playboy, the simpleton, the fool, they all do not see the destruction that lays ahead, the damage that an irresponsible lifestyle will lead to. But the playboy in particular is driven by his sexual lusts, his lust for the pleasures of the world, and he does not even understand that he is headed towards destruction. The book of Proverbs will speak as an animal headed towards slaughter. Proverbs also speaks about the strange woman. The strange woman seduces the simple, destroys his soul, and leads into paths of death. Uh, this strange woman is a bit comical, but the book of Proverbs speaks much about women hanging about the corner, hanging about the city. These women who are outcasts because they're known for their immoral behavior, but the simple and the fool, they go headlong. They destroy their souls. They destroy their families and their lives. And ultimately it leads to a path of death. Proverbs also speaks about the criminal than a criminal who entices evil, entices people to evil, devises mischief, devises ways of robbing people and stealing from people, who talks perversely, but ultimately his end is death. Not only his end, but the death that he brings upon many others, the destruction and the brutality that often comes with criminal behavior. The book of Proverbs also talks about the man of integrity. The man of integrity, of wholeness, of rightness, of purity. The man of integrity loves what is right and pleasing to God. And as a result, receives protection and prosperity from God. 
the man of integrity who does what is right because it's the right thing to do, who does the right thing even though no one else is watching. But the man of integrity knows that God is watching and will take care. The man of integrity, whole righteous living with protection and prosperity as the outcome. Now let's talk about some principles for the interpretation of Proverbs. How do we go about collecting individual and corporate themes from the book of Proverbs and properly interpreting them? Remember that much of Proverbs is based on cultural imagery. Often there are many poetic elements to it. And so at the end of the presentation, there will be a recommendation of resources to help you in the study of the book of Proverbs. A good principle when studying any book of the Bible is to read through the entire book to get an orientation to the author, the main argument or arguments and purposes. With Proverbs, it's good to read through the entire book to get an orientation to the different types of Proverbs. And you want to allow the translators to help guide you as they divide the sections into subjects, paragraphs, and verses. But you just want to get a feel for the entire book and begin to collect your orientation, your thoughts, about the style of writing. Secondly, you just want to read Proverbs again. And now you can start taking notes, but you don't want to start taking detailed notes that would bog you down or slow you down from simply recognizing the major sections by extended themes. Here again, the translators and even study Bibles will be of help for us, but let the study notes and things like that go for now. You want to continue to immerse your mind in the book of Proverbs and simply write down what you see as the major structure of the book and what are some of the major extended themes. On this third reading of the book of Proverbs, you want to begin to take more detailed notes. Read again and note the themes that are repeated throughout the book. Now, every time you read Proverbs, you're going to find some additional themes. But read through it and record the themes that you see as you read along. You could use three by five cards. You could use a notebook. But what you want to do is to put at the heading a theme that you see, that you're understanding, and then just keep track of those verses. Remember that Proverbs, or Proverbs tells us, Solomon tells us that this is a collection, that we can search through it to be able to understand it. In my study of Proverbs over the years, I have collected over a hundred different themes from the book of Proverbs. You now have different categories and you want to begin to collect references to the various themes. So now you can go through the entire book of Proverbs and you can look at a theme that you have seen and try to collect as much detail as you can. And this is a really fun spiritual exercise because you can collect themes on family, on communication, on characters, on friendship, on love, on anger, on lust, things to be afraid of, things not to be afraid of, work ethic, work environment, management principles. There are so many that you can collect and bring together these specific statements, brief specific statements about situational circumstances that provides practical situational truth. Now that you have a number of themes, you can begin to systematize the themes 
into various categories if you would like. Categories like family life. Under family life, you could have marriage and parenting and sibling relationships. Underneath business, you could have integrity, you could have ethics, you could have work ethic. Uh, there's so many categories. You could talk about a sexual sin and sexual sin prevention. You could talk about neighborhood relationships and how to get along with others. And so now you can begin to shape the material into systematic categories. And from these, you can bring forth wisdom lessons and wisdom sermons that you could share with others. After you have systematized the material, it's always helpful to try to encapsulate the essence of the theme. So write a summary statement for each of the various themes. The summary statement in some ways would be an introductory sentence that would introduce your audience to a series that you were going to do on the book of Proverbs, a series again on family, on business, on health, on neighborhood relationships, on government. You use the summary statement in order to encapsulate the information so that you will be able to introduce people to the overall theme, the overall subject of a series that you might be teaching. Now let's look at the parallelism that we see so often in poetry and in Proverbs. And this is not just unique to the Bible, this is unique to all poetic or wisdom literature, and we use these in our everyday speech. In the book of Proverbs, one of the most common ones is a contrast. This has also been called antithetical uh, parallelism. Antithetical is the opposites. This occurs when the poet places a line in contrast to its corresponding or first line. For instance, Proverbs 10.4, poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A negligent hand produces poverty. A diligent hand produces prosperity. And so this is a contrast between the poor and the rich, between the negligent hand and the diligent hand. This is simply an example of contrast. And it's very common in Proverbs, the contrast between a wise lifestyle and an unwise lifestyle. The second most common usage in Proverbs is that of comparison. This has also been called emblematic parallelism. This is related to the subordination category of parallelism in that the comparative clause is subordinate to the other, secondary to the other. A comparison is made between two lines in such a way that they form a simile. This is like this. Proverbs 10, 26. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy one to those who send him. Now, Proverbs was trying to create a picture, a sensation for us. Ooh, vinegar to the teeth, smoke to the eyes. You remember being around a fire at some time, a fire pit, and the smoke gets in your eyes and it burns and it hurts. So is the lazy one to those who send him. The, the lazy one is just an annoyance, a pain, an irritation when you send them to do something and it doesn't get done. So the proverb, the poetry, is trying to relate a life experience to other life experiences and the unpleasantness of that experience.
A third form of parallelism in poetry and proverbs is subordination. In this case, one line is grammatically subordinate to the other line. The first line can make a statement. The second line will provide a qualifier. Proverbs 3, 27 says, do not withhold good for those to whom it is due. This is a command. Then there is the temporal or the circumstantial qualifier. When it is in your power to do it. Now, when it's not in your power to do it, then you cannot do the good. But if you have the power, the authority, the ability, the resources, then you ought to do it. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. The second statement is subordinate to or the conditional part of fulfilling the first command. Continuation, parallelism in poetry and Proverbs. With this type of parallel, each successive line presents a progression in the thought, a kind of elevation and heightening at times in moving the thought forward. An example here is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. You see, we go from Zion, which is more the mountain upon which Jerusalem sits, to Jerusalem, and then to all the cities of Judah, from a hill to the whole city, to all of the region or the region of the cities of Judah, from good news to here is your God. And so there is a building and intensification or heightening, a continuation of the main thought of being the bearer of good news. Staircase parallelism is simply the description, the name that has been given this form of poetry and writing. It is an extension of the preceding type of parallelism. It's an extension of the continuation. But with this type of parallelism, each line builds on the preceding line with certain repeated words. A key thought would be repeated from the preceding line plus then additional items will be added to the line. So you're stepping up the stairs with similar words and then adding additional information. Psalms 29.1, ascribe to the Lord O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And then the culmination, worship the Lord in holy array. It is simply the recognizing of the structure of the writer in stepping up this praise to the Lord and the worship that he so justly deserves. Specification is another category that uh, students or teachers of poetry and Proverbs have recognized in parallelism. It is simply a technique that the writers have used. With this type of parallelism, each line adds more specific details to the first line, a general statement is made and then more specific details are provided. Sometimes this specification or details might involve spatial elements or explanatory elements or something with dramatic effect or purpose. In Proverbs chapter four, verse one, 
it provides an example of purposeful specification. The writer begins by saying, Hear, O sons. Hear what? The instruction of a father. And the purposes give attention that you may gain understanding. In other words, hear the instructions of your father and the purposes, not just to hear him, but to really hear him so that you can gain understanding as you give attentive hearing. In the parallelism of intensification, the second line, and sometimes there's then a third and a fourth and a fifth line, but the second line or the line following the previous one rephrases the first in a forceful or intense manner. Therefore, for example, in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19, the writer is actually building the proverb to point four, but he will use steps along the way. There are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way it soars and floats in a sense, the way of a serpent on a rock, how it can move up and down and through the rocks, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, the way it can move about and is tossed around, and then the way of a man with a maid. These things are wonderful to the writer, but each one builds on the next to come to the fourth, which is the greatest wonder of all for this writer, that of the man with the maid. Parallelism of chiasm, some would say chiasm. This involves a reversal of elements in each line. It has also been called inverted parallelism. It is like an X. This example of inverted parallelism is a form of synonymous parallelism. You have A, B, then B1, and A1. In other words, the yellow, the A and the A1, are referring to each other. The green, the B and the B1, refer to each other. So you say something and then you reverse the order to say the same thing. O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. The kings are the judges. The discernment is taking the warning. And this chiasm can go on for many, many verses. And in fact, some psalms are completely created by the use of chiasm or chiasm. Now, before we leave this, we want to remember that these categories are not divine categories. These are categories that are created by teachers, by students, by people studying scripture, studying poetry, studying Proverbs, ways in which they have categorized the various methods that not just biblical writers, but that all writers will use when communicating poetry or proverbs. So these are ways of understanding what is being said, what is being written, but these are not divine categories, and there are others, and you might discover some of these kinds of parallels when interpreting the scriptures. But we need to remember to get behind the words and to understand the culture also. We will have a PowerPoint presentation on 
culture and how it transfers over time. But we need to see the experiences, the picture, the circumstances, the things that are being painted for us to smell and to see and to imagine so that we understand what the writer is trying to communicate through the sensations of poetry, of wisdom, and of life. There is only one assignment for this PowerPoint presentation. Read through Proverbs and collect at least 10 themes. Themes are repeated words or repeated synonyms that relate to the same subject. Note the chapter and verse for each theme. After you have collected 10 or more themes, write a short paragraph on what the verses communicate about the theme. So you might collect on money, on friendship, on different themes and people that are in the book of Proverbs. But after you've collected all of those verses, then write that paragraph summarizing what Proverbs has to say about money, about certain characters, about friendship, about communication, whatever themes that you see. You should also note that each one of these themes could be a preaching or teaching lesson if you dig into the details. Then compare the verses to the parallel categories that were taught in this PowerPoint, and then just write the categories next to each verse. Well, let me recommend some resources for the study of Proverbs or poetry, and for that matter, anything dealing with customs and culture and manners of the Old Testament. Bullinger's Figures of Speech, which is a older work, is still of great value because of the amount of work and classification and interpretation that Bullinger's provides. Any kind of a book that's underneath the category of manners and customs or illustrated Bible books. InterVarsity Press has two commentaries, one for Old Testament, one for New Testament, that are strictly focused on manners and customs and background information. And this is all arranged verse by verse, and these are quite good. Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias. You can also do an internet search, as there are some wonderful blogs that will focus on manners and customs and figures of speech. Two resources for buying books or evaluating books online is the Christian Book Distributors website. They provide a wonderful list of books for various topics, and then they provide ratings. And then, of course, Amazon provides a lot of books, a lot of evaluations by customers and short reviews. And with Amazon and Christian book distributors, you can open up the book and you can read the table of contents and you can even read some chapters to get an idea as to if you want that book and if it has the kind of information uh, that you uh, desire to have. So these are all good resources always single volume commentaries that focus on the original language and that have a concentration on just that book. So a commentary that only covers Genesis or Exodus or Matthew or Romans. These are books that will provide more detail. Primarily for customs and manners, you're going to find yourself looking when you're studying the Old Testament more than the New Testament. But all of these books are of value in helping us to properly and rightly interpret the Word of God.
This PowerPoint, as well as all PowerPoint presentations by Dr. John McLean, are copyrighted and should not be duplicated or used without written permission. The purpose of this PowerPoint is to explain the hermeneutics or Bible study methods principles for the genre of wisdom literature, in particular, the book of Proverbs.